This Sunday, crime and punishment. President Biden backs down from fighting a Republican effort to block D.C.'s more lenient approach to crime. We will make Chicago the safest city in America. Just days after the perception of rising crime took down Chicago's mayor. We fought the right fights. Can Biden's moves help Democrats from being seen as soft on crime going into 2024? Plus, divide and conquer. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis isn't officially in the race yet, but he's eagerly courting Trump's base. I think there's a strong anti-woke majority uh, out there across the country. The primary fight is kicked into high gear as more candidates consider challenging Trump. For those who have been wronged and betrayed, I am your retribution. I'll talk to New Hampshire Republican Governor Chris Sununu, who's considering his own White House run. And confronting China, a bipartisan push to face the growing threats from Beijing. This is an existential struggle over what life will look like in the 21st century. Tensions continue to escalate as the U.S. warns about supplying arms to Russia and new concern over COVID's origins. The origins of the pandemic are most likely a potential lab incident in Wuhan. In a joint interview, I'll talk to the chair and ranking member of the House Intelligence Committee, Republican Mike Turner of Ohio and Democrat Jim Himes of Connecticut. Joining me for insight and analysis are NBC News senior Washington correspondent Hallie Jackson, former Homeland Security Secretary Jay Johnson, USA Today Washington Bureau Chief Susan Page, and former Republican Governor of North Carolina Pat McCrory. Welcome to Sunday. It's Meet the Press. From NBC News in Washington, the longest running show in television history, this is Meet the Press with Chuck Todd. Good Sunday morning. This may be the week where we saw the 2024 presidential campaign kick into full gear. And not just on the Republican side. President Biden's decision to block a D.C. crime law caught many Democrats off guard because it's going to be the first time in 30 years that Congress has nullified a law in D.C. And it's a Democratic president and a Democratic Senate. But if you view it through the lens of political calculation, it may make perfect sense. President Biden decided that neither he nor his party, with a big Senate map to defend, with a lot of red areas to defend, could afford to look soft on crime heading into 2024. Republicans tried to make crime a central issue in the 2022 midterms, and they certainly had some success in New York State and a few other areas. But the results this week in the Chicago mayor's race, where voters fired the incumbent, are a reminder that crime and policing are still important to urban voters as well, a huge part of the Democratic coalition. Democrats have been twisted in knots on the crime issue because it's a problem with swing voters, and Biden is trying to provide them with a way forward the mirror image of sort of being twisted in knots for Republicans is the abortion issue. Um, but no one in the GOP, at least to date, is taking the lead to try and come up with a modified solution to that political problem for them. If anything, the Republicans are more fractured, and not just on the abortion issue, but about the general direction of the party. It's a divide that has been on full display this weekend. But there's one issue where there is little divide these days, and it is on China with its rising national security threats. The Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, issued yet another direct warning to China about sending lethal aid to Russia for the war in Ukraine. China can't have it both ways. It can't be putting itself out as a force for peace in public while it, one way or another, continues to fuel the flames of this fire that uh, Vladimir Putin started. So we want to dig deeper into this. Joining me now are the chair and ranking member of the House Intelligence Committee, appearing here together, Republican Congressman Mike Turner of Ohio and Democratic Congressman Jim Himes of Connecticut. Gentlemen, welcome back to Meet the Press, and thank you for coming on together. Thanks for having, Thanks for having us. Uh, before we start uh, on this stuff, your, uh, this train derailment overnight happened in your uh, congressional district. Uh, I know the shelter-in-place order is no longer. What, what more can you tell us? What more have you learned, and is the federal government responding? Sure. This truly is outrageous. You know, Ohio is sort of the crossroads of America, both on the road and in rail. An unbelievable amount of goods travel through Ohio, some hazardous. What we've seen you know, recently with the risk to communities is, is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. uh, luckily, it seems we may have missed a bullet in this one, that uh, this train may have been empty, and it looks like that hazardous materials is not going to be a threat to the community. We'll have to see. Uh, is it clear? Do you think it's clear that the freight industry isn't well regulated and needs to be? Oh, absolutely. I mean, and the, the fact that we're having derailment after derailment shows really the, the lack of investment, the, the disinvestment in our infrastructure, and that needs to change. Um, let me move to this. Congressman Hines, I'll, I'll, I'll start with this. I know both of you have been getting these briefings. Uh, another warning to China. We heard it from the Secretary of State about arming Russia. Our reporting indicates that this actually came 
from our intelligence inside of Russia, confirmed around what's How serious is this threat, and do we know if China uh, has made a final decision? Well, um, no question it's a serious threat. Uh, we've seen the Russian military obviously come apart. Uh, the Chinese could reverse that in the same way that the Iranians are helping the Russians right now. Uh, I think the administration is doing the right thing by saying, don't do this. Now, it doesn't surprise me at all that there's a debate inside China about whether they should do this. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, wisdom prevails. Uh, I, I couldn't help but note in, China, in the Chinese proposed peace plan, the 12th point said we need to focus on rebuilding China, uh, uh, rebuilding Russia. Mm-hmm. I can imagine the Chinese see a lot of business there. Obviously, if they're part of the uh, Russian assault on Ukraine, they will not get that business. So, no, I don't think a final decision has been made, but I do think it's wise for us to say, don't go there. Congressman Turner, you, you, you've noted that we have a different posture now on our intelligence. We're releasing more of it. Uh, do you think more of it should be released to make sure the world believes us? Right. Well, and obviously you've seen with the CIA director even mm-hmm. calling out China on this issue that yes. they're considering it as a huge shift in policy. And what we're seeing is the administration using intelligence to try to impact the outcome of, of policy, right? So they're not just saying, we happen to know this and looking to hold someone accountable. They're trying to thwart them, to stop them from doing this. You know, the problem with China entering this is because, you know, you've got the West uh, giving weapons to Ukraine. You've got uh, Russia depleting their stores. We obviously, the West together, have an ability to impact Ukraine greater than Russia alone does. There would be an inexhaustible source of, of weapons if China in its production capacity mm-hmm. supported Russia, and that would change the dynamic. What kind of intel do we have on the state of the Russian army, Congressman Himes? Meaning, like, I, we've seen some reports that they may be running out of munitions. They have some issues. What does our folks say? Well, um, so n- neither Mike nor I can get too deep into any uh, particular intel, but you mm-hmm. know you don't need to get too deep into intel. Consider the fact that you see every single day on television, which is the entire Russian army mm-hmm. cannot take a town that nobody had ever heard of uh, a year ago, the town of Bakhmut. Now, you know, Mike and I have been doing this long enough that we remember when we literally devoted hundreds of billions of dollars and much of our national security apparatus to this beast of yeah. a Russian military. Today, we see that they can't, if even even with the push of the president, Vladimir Putin, they can't take a town. That doesn't mean they're not still dangerous. They have nuclear weapons, but they are not what we thought they were. I want to play something. Sergei Lavrov was at the G20, Congressman Turner. And wait, I mean, where do you hear the reaction to something he said here? Let me play it. The war uh, which uh, we are trying to stop and which was launched against us using the Ukraine, <laughs> Ukrainian people, uh, of course, it influenced, influenced, influenced uh, the uh, policy of Russia. You know, there's nothing like being able to say the phrase, the world is laughing at them. Completely. The and world is laughing at them. Spontaneously. What should, a, what should the West use a moment like that for? Well, the thing about both Putin, Lavrov, and even Medvedev, although he's supposed to be the new, new face of a, of a new Russia, come from an era where, you know, they controlled Eastern Europe. They could say things that were not true, and people believed them because they controlled information. Today, information can't be controlled. Mm-hmm. So the... Uh, the laughability uh, of, of right. what they're saying, the ridiculousness of what they're saying is easily exposed. All right, let me move to uh, the issue of these classified documents. Um, nobody seems to be satisfied with, with what you got. Uh, Congressman Heim, does that include you? Were you satisfied with the briefing? So we have a lot more work to do. Look, I think as uh, the leaders of the Intelligence Committee, our number one job is to make sure that the DNI, the FBI, whoever needs to do it, does everything they need to do to protect the sources and methods that might have been exposed uh, were any of those documents to have been out in the wild. So there's a lengthy process to figure out that. And and I I can't speak for Mike, but I will tell you that though we have been brief, we've got a lot more to do to make sure that the government is doing what it should be doing. Well, let me ask specifically, do you know what the Trump docs are? Congressman Turner, we, we, do you know we, what the Biden docs are, and do you know what the what the Pence docs are? No, but we, there are some things that we do know. And, and first off, I want to stop there. No, they didn't share with you those things in a classified setting, right? Why? But, well, first off, we, we if the, in the things that we do know, one okay. of the things we know is that the FBI is not being forthcoming. Uh, they're they're not giving us the information. Um, they're claiming that it's going to affect the outcome of, of their investigation, which, of course, it can't because the people who are the targets of their investigation know what's, what are in those documents. Right. And we have the clearance and the ability to, to look at these documents. Um, we also know uh, from Avril Haines that she said that, that she was not consulted prior to the raid on, on Trump's mar lago home, uh, that, in fact, there, it was not a national security basis. Um, so... 
as we go through this process, is they give us the category of the documents and their assessment as to who had access to them, who did not have access to them. We're beginning to build an understanding. But the, the thing that we know is that it's unbelievable that administration after administration is apparently yeah. uh, sloppy and messy in their use of classified documents. And that's one thing on a bipartisan basis we have to address well beyond just this. This has to right. change where classified documents are under a certain amount of control. But Congressman Himes, do you, do you know... Do you at least know the classification levels of these docs? Do you know, is there a, dis, is there a distinction between the t Trump docs, the Biden docs, and the Pence docs or not? So we have not been shown anything that would allow us to draw that conclusion. And we've got to be a little careful here because what we were shown... So you we were weren't briefed the, much. Uh, well, we were, we were briefed, but, I, but, but, but let's just say that neither one of us are satisfied that we got enough information to execute our primary responsibility of making right. sure that sources and methods have been protected. We've got more to learn before we can be satisfied on that. So right now, you have no idea whether these were the highest level well, we didn't say or no, the mid-level? We didn't say no idea. Okay. Uh, again, we can't get too into the details. We got a flavor for what uh, was there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I won't speak for Mike, but I will tell you, having been given a flavor, this is a very serious issue. This wasn't stuff that we can say clearly does not matter. It matters. In all three cases? Well, uh, again, we don't, know. we don't know yet. One, used, one thing I would tell you, Chuck, yeah. which is important, which is also the symbolism of the fact that Jim and I are here together. I, I was just going to say, Devin Nunes and Adam Schiff, I don't <laughs> right, know if would have done this Right. We, we, we have shifted, and it takes two, to shift to a bipartisan basis. And you see it on the Senate side, too, with Marco Rubio, right. Senator Warner. And a, the approach to this issue of the Biden docs, <clears throat> the Trump docs, and the Pence docs, we're looking at holistically, what do we have to do to fix this? How do we address this? What were the risks involved? And you have to understand also that without Congress having asked, there wasn't even a risk assessment yeah. being done. We were the ones who initiated this. That's, that's part of the concern. I get the sense that the, that the intel community doesn't trust Congress. And you guys, is that fair? Do you think you guys have to rebuild your, you have to prove to them that you're trustworthy with secrets? I would say it's more of a tension between the FBI okay. and Congress than it is the intelligence community because we're having more FBI in Congress. Uh, absolutely, and I think that's going to, to come to a head over the next couple of years. You're seeing it in a number of areas where they're just not, you know, they are not special. They don't have greater privileges than the mm -hmm. president does, um, and they're continuing to act as, as if they have some privilege to be able to operate without congressional oversight. Congressman Hines, I'm curious what you if you that piece of, about sort of the tension between Maine Justice and the FBI having to do with retrieving the classified documents from Mar-a-Lago. Um, it, it looks like there was fear going in of retribution. The FBI is... Do you are they more concerned about perception than whether they're doing their job? Are you worried about this? Well, two things about the FBI. First of all, uh, and Mike's right, they are subject to congressional oversight. Secondly, they do have to preserve the integrity of their investigation, and there mm -hmm. are investigations on board right now. So we need to work with them because both of us, everybody wants them to be able to do investigations in an unsloppy manner. We've got too much of a history of investigations mm -hmm. in a somewhat sloppy manner. But of course there was consternation. Look, it's one thing to conduct a raid uh, on, an, on average Joe citizen to conduct a raid on a former president who, and I hope I don't insult uh, my, my good chairman here, who was sort of known for his uh, you know, aggressive retribution mm -hmm. uh, against people he didn't like, I'm sure that got a lot of discussion. But you know, look, the lesson to be drawn here is if you don't want to raid on your, on your home, don't take a year to cough up documents that we yeah. know are out there. The COVID origin. Or, or, Go ahead. Or, or, or six years. Because uh, Biden, <laughs> I, I, Biden, I, so Biden, Biden enough, took six. Fair right. enough. The, 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 one, the one aspect that's, a, that's important here is that Merrick Garland uh, did a, a, an unbelievable, uh, terrible political miscalculation. He appointed a special prosecutor against Trump, not realizing he was going to end up having to appoint one against his own boss. Right. And that's yeah. gonna, that, how that's going to play out is going to be amazing. Let's talk about the, the COVID origin situation. I think a lot of people... Uh, we're surprised to learn that the Energy Department had an intelligence agency. And in fairness, and I, I, you know, some of us know that it's true. They deal with our, our nukes. There's a reason for it. But a lot of people didn't know. But I want to, they, they labeled it low confidence. So how should the public take that? Well, it's not actually been released yet. These are all leaks that are, are reporting this. Great. So, so, so all leaks. the more right. helpful to <laughs> right, right. messing right. up this story. So, so we fair. will neither yeah. confirm nor deny that they actually said that. But, okay. but let's assume that they did. Um, in, in all of this, because there's no direct evidence, we don't have China admitting it, we don't have Wuhan lab handing these things over, right. all this is being assessed by looking at, at other aspects of the release. Uh, but I can tell you what, what one thing that's, that's of great concern is that the, the 90 day review that was undertaken, whether mm -hmm. it was both a classified report and an unclassified report that came out from the intelligence community, in my opinion, they don't match. If you read the unclassified version and then you read the classified version, you would have thought that, that there would have been other things 
uh, other conclusions in the unclassified version. And I think that's what we're seeing now is beginning to leak out, mm -hmm. is that there are people who are saying, wait, I disagree with the underlying uh, conclusion of the unclassified version. Congressman Himes, it, we're, we're told this is still a minority view, but the FBI director basically, it seems, used the Energy Department leak as a, he wanted to go out there and he reaff reaffirmed something that we had already known, that the FBI was leaning more towards leak. Yeah, look, I mean, you need to take a step back here. And just as, as Mike said, we have so few facts because the Chinese regime has obfuscated. Look, this is hard to figure out when you can do it in Atlanta at the CDC if something right. goes wrong. We have so few facts that inevitably different agencies are going to arrive at different conclusions. And when an agency slightly adjusts its, um, right. its uh, interpretation, as the Department of Energy may have done, that doesn't mean that all of a sudden the government has a firm view. It may be forever before we actually know exactly what don't happened. We need, don't we need a 9-11? Commission, something like this. I mean, isn't this we need the necessary? Chinese to we need the we Chinese that, to cooperate. Don't we need something like this? Well, the, the Speaker Kevin McCarthy yeah. has appointed a COVID um, select committee okay. that is bipartisan and is beginning this process. In addition, there is now a China select committee looking at really 360, the right. issues with respect to the national security threats of China. So those things are moving forward in Congress beyond just what our committee is doing and other committees of jurisdiction. There are now committees that are solely focused on just this issue. All right, Congressman Turner and Himes, this is terrific. I look forward to doing this quite a bit with you guys you. over the next Thank day. You. When we come back, is it still Donald Trump's Republican Party? Well, it sure looks like it. And if you're one of his opponents, how do you navigate those waters? I'm going to ask Republican Governor Chris Sununo of New Hampshire is considering his own run next. Welcome back. Republican presidential candidates were off and running this week, meeting the party faithful at two mainstays of Republican politics. Former President Trump and former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley were among the top hopefuls attending the Conservative Political Action Conference, known as CPAC. While Florida Governor Ron DeSantis promoted his new book in stops in California and Texas after speaking to donors at the annual meeting of the Club for Growth, which was also attended by our next guest. Trump, DeSantis, and Haley all are going to make their way to Iowa in the week ahead as well. But it was clear from President Trump's comments at CPAC, the battle for the heart of the base has already begun. They cannot steer me, they cannot shake me, and they will never, ever control me, and they will never, ever, therefore, control you. At the end of the day, anyone else will be intimidated, bought off, blackmailed, or ripped to shreds. I alone will never retreat. Joining us now, a man who may be going up against the former president for the GOP presidential nomination. It's New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu. Governor Sununu, welcome back to Meet the Press. Thanks so much. All right. Well, you spoke at a donor conference this weekend. It was about national politics, potentially running for president. Are you closer to a decision? And, it, and, and what, what is holding you back if you're not? Yeah, so, no, I'm, I'm not really focusing on the decision right now. There'll be plenty of time for that. Right now, my mission is making sure we're making this party bigger, frankly. Uh, you can't govern if you don't win, and so I'm really focused on how do we win, no matter who the candidate is. How do we win in November of 24? Well, we have to attract independence. We have to bring that next generation of voter more on the team. There's a lot of gap between where we are as Republicans and the younger, let's call it the 27 and under mm -hmm. generation of potential Republicans. So I'm trying to steer the message in the right way. I'm trying to get folks a little more optimistic, inspirational, hopeful for this great product that I think the Republicans have. Sometimes we're just not so great on the messaging. You know, it's interesting to me that you, you're at Club for Growth talking about making making this your message. The Club for Growth last year supported a lot of candidates that Donald Trump supported. Now, they've broken from him on the presidential, but they, they, they spent a lot of time not supporting candidates that you just described, not supporting the candidates that arguably would have tried to uh, grow the party or appeal to the middle. Have you heard any regret at this conference about how Club for Growth uh, worked in 2022? No, look, it's not about regret. I think the entire Republican Party, hopefully they looked at November of 22, saw that we didn't win the races that we should have won, understand the value of candidate quality, of messaging, of getting out there early, of not letting Democrats define you early. It's not just about money. It's about having that collective message that has to go forward about being more optimistic, about being something that folks want to join, um, not just with their dollars, but yeah. with their vote, hopefully in November. Uh, and not, like I said, not let those Democrats define it. So no, I think it's just a, a fundamental change in approach that I think the entire Republican Party is very open to and looking forward to as we hit the November election. I, 
I understand what you're trying to do. At the same time, you heard the former president at CPAC, and he certainly has a stranglehold on 25 to 35 percent of the party. We can have a debate about the specific number. And you know what those folks want. They want to make liberals cry, right? Like, that's the message they want. They want that more than they want a big tent. So how do you appeal to those voters? You focus on leadership that is results driven, that gets stuff done. You know, in, in 2017 and 2018, as a Republican, I was told we were going to get immigration reform. It didn't happen. I was told about health care reform. I was told about balancing a budget and taking care of our debt, not spending more than we actually have, actually working towards free trade and these types of things that can be economic engine and drivers. A lot of that did not happen. Because some good things happened. Don't get me wrong. I give the president credit where, where it's deserved on regulatory reform and his speed of the vaccine, things like that. But a lot of things didn't happen. If you want to if there's that part of the party that wants to, as you said, make liberals cry or whatever it might be, mm -hmm. uh, you do it by winning and you do it by getting stuff done, passing it through Congress, working on both sides, taking the first steps of securing the border and immigration reform. You do it by getting stuff done, not just through through winning a nomination. You got to close right. the deal and you got to get it done uh, in 25. And so that's what we're doing. We're looking for the most conservative candidate that can win in 24 and actually work with Congress to to kind of finish the deal, finish on that obligation, that accountability in 25. Look, you're. You may be running to lead a party that did this yesterday. The Texas Republican Party censured a Republican member of Congress, Tony Gonzalez, who won a swing district, okay, in an area that, you know, it's not always easy for Republicans to win. And his two sins were supporting a gun uh, reform bill following the, the shooting at Ovalde and uh, for cod voting to codify same-sex marriage protections. And I looked at what he was censured for, and I'm like, boy, they haven't met Governor Sununu yet in Texas. <laughs> well, look, there, there are aspects of the Republican Party, whether it's the Texas Republican Party, the New Hampshire Republican Party, all the different uh, groups that are out there. Uh, they have their own vision. They have their own leadership. They have their own agendas, of course. Uh, that's why, as candidates, we have to be about what we're about, what we're going to deliver, uh, the accountability that we believe in, standing up and making sure we actually not just win the election, but show up and actually do the job. That's mm -hmm. what ultimately galvanizes support around you. And Republicans cannot win without independence. It cannot happen. So if we just stay in this uh, ultra-conservative extreme lane, which is a very small part of the party, by the way, mm -hmm. um, that's all we're going... I, I get it. That's where the headlines are going to be, right? But at the end of the day, if we can get stuff done, I think governors do a great job of that. Mayors do a great job of that. Senate and Congress, not so much on either side of the aisle. But governors and mayors have a, an amazing ability every day to make decisions, to impact people's lives and deliver results. And that's exactly what folks are going to be looking for in 24. The RNC uh, chair, Ronna McDaniel, says that she wants to have candidates sign a pledge. They'll support the Republican nominee, no matter who it is, if you want to participate in an RNC-sanctioned event. Are you comfortable signing that pledge as, uh, if Donald Trump's involved? Yeah, look, I, I'm a lifelong Republican. I'm going to support the Republican nominee. When you look at what's coming out of the White House, it, it isn't Democrat policies. It's real left-wing, extreme agenda-type stuff that is not in the best interest of this country. And I have no doubt that any solid Republican is, is, would be better than, than, um, than what comes out. As far as former President Trump, I think he's going to run, obviously. He's in the race. He's not going to be the nominee. That's just not going to happen. Um, and so I think there's a lot of opportunity to bring forward what the, the Republican Party, not what we were, not yesterday's leadership or yesterday's story um, or, or crying about what happened in November of 22, but what we're going to bring to the table and get done tomorrow. That's what America is looking for. And so I'm really confident that whoever comes out uh, of the Republican nomination process is, uh, is going to lead this country and, and will be able to deliver a win in 24. And I'll back them. You know, New Hampshire Republicans have a habit of actually always take, going for the outsider, whatever that moment is, in that moment, who the outsider candidate is. And it's been remarkable to me that Donald Trump looks like he's trying to be the outsider. He, was, he ran the party. He was the institutional <laughs> head of the party. He's running as an outsider, I, and I know you want to be the outsider, but in many ways, he's already lumped everybody against him. Do you think he's effectively carving out an outsider lane for himself? 
I think the former president has his own lane. He doesn't need to carve anything. He's an absolute known commodity uh, to every American in this country, right? There's very few people that are on the fence, whether they're with him or not with him or whatever it might be. So uh, I, I'm not, I, don't, I think he just has his lane. And then there's everyone else, which is a, a vast majority of the party that's looking for an alternative. Right now, if the election were today, Ron DeSantis would win in New Hampshire. There's no doubt about that in my mind. Uh, I think Ron DeSantis would right. win in Florida. So um, he's, I think the former president is trying to find a path to be back that, that leading voice of the party. I think a lot of us are, uh, you know, that, that potentially may get in the race, want to have something to say about the direction of that conversation. But yeah. um, look, I, again, thank you for your service. We're moving on. Uh, I just don't believe the Republican Party is going to say that the best leadership for America tomorrow is yesterday's leadership. That doesn't make any sense. That is not in our DNA as Americans. Yeah. It's kind of the antithesis of the American spirit to settle for yesterday's news. We want the next generation, the next big idea. And that's what we're going to deliver. Uh, the abortion issue is one that I think is twisted. If, if the crime issue is twisted, the Democrats and not. The abortion issue is twisted, the Republican Party and not. A lot of people dismiss your candidacy by simply saying the Republican Party is never going to nominate somebody who calls themselves pro-choice or has been identified as pro-choice. Uh, how do you change that sentiment in the party? Well, the, the whole dynamic around that issue has changed, right? So uh, most governors are taking it upon themselves to either, if they're pro-life, they're moving to ban it. And in some states, they're making that choice. That's between them and, and their voters. Uh, there are some governors that are, are looking for this whole, you know, pro-abortion stuff up until the day of birth, and we'll see where that goes. That's, that's terrible. New Hampshire has a 24-week rule. Some states have 20 weeks or 16 weeks. That's where we all are, right? So we all provide, the majority of us provide some choice in, in some fashion. But if you're pro-life, then those governors are going to truly ban it. Uh, if you're pro-abortion yeah. there, and the rest of us are kind of in the middle here. So I just think the fundamental conversation has changed so much. Uh, not that it's not an important, uh, an important issue, but folks are going to have to really define themselves as to where they are. I, I, don't, I don't worry about it too much because yeah. we have a 24-week rule in New Hampshire. It's, it's pretty much where most of America is. You know, you said something interesting in one of your previous interviews about, you know, this idea that if you get in, it could dilute the field and that helps Trump. And you said it's not about getting in. It's about knowing when to get out. So what does that mean? Yeah. Well, that means, look, I, 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 one thing I've learned, uh, I, look, I've won four times. Uh, I, I've, I've been in this political game for a while. I've learned that you can't tell people not to run. If someone really wants to run, they're going to run, and that's fine. But unlike 2016, I'm going to make sure, and I think other folks are going to make sure, that we all have the discipline to get out uh, yeah. before it's too late. And those that don't, uh, I think, will be chastised very publicly for doing so. But i got to be honest. I've talked to all the candidates. They all understand that. They really do. Um, we're going to take our time. There's still a lot to play out over the next nine months to see who can really galvanize right. uh, to make sure that we have a candidate that's winning a true majority of the vote. And I have no com I have full confidence, I should say, that we're going to get there. By the way, have you ruled out running for governor again? No, look, I don't rule anything out. I, I really don't. I'm, I'm, I, I'm in the, I just, mm -hmm. I just passed, uh, I didn't pass it yet. I submitted my, uh, my balanced budget uh, yeah. with a big surplus and, and, and all yeah. that kind of stuff to the legislature. I got to go through my legislative session. So yeah. I love being governor. I mean, I love it. It is a job unlike any other. Uh, so we'll see what happens, you know, in the future. What, uh, what do you think Rupert Murdoch and Fox News need to do to regain some trust uh, after what we've learned about this? And are you at all concerned you can have an honest conversation with Fox viewers? Oh, oh, I don't think it's just Fox. I, I mean, I'll put them in there, but all of media, all of television media, and everyone has to own a little bit uh, of the lack of trust, the lack of accountability. It's okay to get something wrong in the news, but you got to come back and own it. And yep. whether it's Fox or CNN or MSNBC or, or you know, whatever, everyone just has to own it. As a governor, I might try four or five things, and if one or two don't work, I'll say, hey, that didn't work. What about intentionally but lying to viewers? So we can acknowledge it. We can pay yeah. the funding. Intentionally lying to viewers, though, that, that to me well, seemed to cross look, the line. You can make a mistake, but that's, that wasn't a mistake. So explain to me that, I, look, I'm not defending anybody because I think you're all, you're all in the same basket. I really do. But I could go to CNN when they talk, when they're going to ignore the, the Hunter Biden laptop story. We could talk about the virus coming, truly coming out of the lab in Wuhan. We could talk about a lot of different things. If you're not owning that you misrepresented the story, whether it was intentional or not, yeah. uh, everybody does it. And that's the problem. America is losing faith in media. And you guys have right. a huge opportunity to regain that. 
But right now, my message to Fox News is build your ratings, build your audience, yep. go bigger. Because if we don't go bigger as a Republican Party, we can't win in November. So I want them to talk to independents more, not change our values or who we are yep. or what we're talking about as Republicans, but get more uh, opportunistic about the chance to bring more people in. Well, Governor, I can promise you this. At NBC News, you make a mistake like that, you would lose your job. Um, I know that uh, here, for, for what it's worth. Uh, Governor Sununu, appreciate you coming not on. Not you. You would never do it. Share, I, I'm share. not worried about you. I appreciate you saying that. <laughs> you bet. Uh, Governor, thanks for coming on and sharing your perspective with us. Appreciate it. Up next, President Biden frustrated some Democrats, but gave a lifeline to others by trying to look tougher on the crime issue. Was it the right move? Panel, plays in next. Welcome back. Panel is here. NBC News Senior Washington Correspondent Hallie Jackson, former Homeland Security Secretary Jay Johnson, former Republican Governor of North Carolina Pat McCrory, and the Bureau Chief of USA Today, Susan Page. Welcome to all of you. Uh, Hallie, I want to start with what I think was the first, you know, we're talking about presidential races gearing up on the Republican sure. side. But President Biden, what he did in, I guess you could call it a triangulation on crime, yeah. uh, we may be nullifying the first law in D.C., I want to play what Mario Bowser's reaction was to this. I interviewed her on Friday. Let me play her reaction, and let's talk about it on the other side. The president had issued a pretty um, direct and very supportive statement of administration about D.C. autonomy, uh, and we wholeheartedly agree. President Biden has been a vocal supporter of D.C. home rule and statehood uh, for Washington, and I vetoed the bill. Uh, unfortunately, we live with the indignity of limited home rule in this in the District of Columbia. All right. This is quickly. Com I'm going to try to get through this fast. It's complicated. D.C. did a rewrite a part of its criminal code. Mayor Bowser vetoed it. Mm -hmm. The city council overturned her veto. Twelve to one, mind you. Uh, and then Congress does have the ability to the House side it does. And they're essentially vetoing the overrule of the veto and nullifying this law, or at least they will. What's interesting here is. I th progressives have been muted in their criticism of the president. It looks like he made the right call here because the party's sort of backing off. Mario Bowser was not ready to criticize him for doing this. Well, it I, I mean, I will tell you there is still a real sense of anger among some Democratic members of Congress who are, in the words of one person that I talked to just yesterday, supremely pissed by what they saw as a surprisingly incompetent move. Again, I'm quoting here yeah. by the White House to, to, as you say, triangulate this way. I think there is a sense, and I've talked with current and former White House officials who believe that this is anger that will essentially blow over on the mm -hmm. politics piece of it. But I've heard questions raised about the credibility that the White House has now moving mm -hmm. forward when there might be other tough votes. Look at what the NRCC, the, the Republican campaign arm, is doing, putting out um, you know, this sort of statement saying, hey, the ad scripts write themselves for these dozens of Democrats who took a tough vote on an issue that has been tough for Democrats. I think there is an acknowledgement from Democrats. They're not where they want to be on crime. I've been uh, encouraged by Democratic sources to yeah. look at it through the lens of the midterms in places like Pennsylvania, where Democrats yeah. did well, where crime was an issue. That, of course, disregards a place like Wisconsin, where that wasn't the case. Or New York. Right. You know, it's interesting here, Jay Johnson. Look, there were 31 Democrats that did vote with the Republicans on this issue in the House. Yes. 20 of the 31 won by less than, with 55% of the vote right. or less on this. The anger coming from House Democrats are folks who thought, wait a minute, you were going to provide cover? You're providing cover for Bob Casey Jr.? You were going to provide cover? I wish you would have told me I might have voted differently. Well, <clears throat> first, I can't believe that the chair and ranking of the House Intel Committee have not seen the classified documents. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, this is not that hard. I used to be yeah. in the middle of those fights. You just simply say to the FBI, look, go to the nearest classified copy machine, put it in a pouch, bring it over here to the Hill, one <laughs> copy, let me see it, and I'll give it right back to you. Yeah. How else is the legislative branch itself supposed to conduct any sort of meaningful oversight on the damage assessment? Yeah. Okay, so uh, Democrats in crime, I've written op-eds on this. I think Joe Biden and Muriel Bowser are absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Democrats lose elections, particularly presidents and mayors, who are perceived as soft on crime, mm -hmm. in blue communities. And it bears emphasis that in big cities, crime is the uppermost issue. Mm -hmm. Just ask people on MLK Avenue, across the river in Anacostia, right. Michigan Avenue, in South Chicago. Um, Crime is an intensely personal issue, and they want to see their leaders address it. This is, this is how we got 
Rudy Giuliani, you know, in 1993 in New York City. Speaking of Republican mayors uh, of Blue Cities, you were one. Absolutely. In 93, 95 to 2000, Giuliani, Daley, McCrory, Mike Turner, uh, Dayton. We had mayors, Republicans and Democrats who were tough on crime because the gangs were taking over cities. Drug trade was taking over cities. The homelessness was taking over our city. And we took aggressive action. And as a result, we had large drops in especially the murder rate and the gang activity. And it was coordinated with the federal government enforcing federal gun laws. And then for whatever reason, the left took over the cities and the Democratic Party nationally. And the crime rate went up because we started letting career criminals back on the street. And it's not. And they're paying for it right now. And they deserve to pay for it. Democrats. It's not like Democrats don't have an argument here. Democrats. Respectfully, Governor, Respectfully. Democrats are the ones that want to get guns off the streets. Yeah. You know, Susan, what's fascinating here is how the mayors, these Democratic mayors, are being pressured. Mm. They're being pressured on both sides because mm. these city councils are way to the left of the mayors. We see it here in D.C. I mean, 12, the, the veto override of Mario Bowser was 12 to 1. <laughs> this wasn't, it wasn't like there was a big divide. The progressives have made a lot of progress on these city councils but they haven't been able to win mayor's races, but it's really put mayors in the crosshairs. Well, and in fairness, they're talking a lot about social justice issues and police reform and the need for that. And we see the need for that Mm -hmm. over and over again in some of the shootings of unarmed black men, which continues across this country. But to make it a choice between crime and social justice is a real problem for Democrats. And I think you see with Joe Biden's decision on where he stands on this, is his re- that is his re-election announcement. On this issue of crime and on border security, he has in recent weeks moved to shore up what would have been the strongest issues yeah. against him in a re-election campaign. And so far, the left's been muted on this. Even on immigration, That's right. you hear the complaints in press releases, but you're not hearing elected officials do it. Coming out on TV, doing Correct. the whole thing, doing the whole circuit. You know, and I would be curious as to Secretary Johnson's perspective on this. I would say to your point, though, when it comes to the, the issue writ large, Democrats, I think truly are looking to get on offense on this. You mentioned something that I've heard that they're looking to do, mm-hmm. which is talk about, for example, the, the assault weapons ban that President yeah. Biden wants. It has mm-hmm. truly pragmatically virtually no shot in, in Congress as it is laid out right now. Funding I've heard about for the COPS program, et cetera. Um, but you also have Democrats who are pointing to, for example, Matt Gates mm-hmm. going out at CPAC this weekend and saying, let's right. abolish the FBI, let's abolish the ATF, and right. hoping to use that as a wedge issue as well. Jay, very quickly... Uh, what do you make so far of what Secretary Mayorkas and the Biden administration have done? It looks like it's working, but we're really find well, out in May, I guess. <clears throat> um, working off what we did in Venezuela in the fall, where yeah. we provided a legal safe pathway, which will discourage people from entering unlawfully. They've expanded that, and <clears throat> it looks like it's working, though it's way too early to declare victory. The numbers were down in January, yeah. but January is typically a low month. Yeah, it takes a couple more months to judge. All right. <clears throat> we're going to get to the good stuff when we come back. Uh, we're going to talk a little Trump when you guys come back. But first, we're going to talk about President Biden's plan to cancel student loan debt and the uncertain future of that. We're going to show you how many borrowers will be impacted and what's really at stake here politically. That's next. Welcome back. Data download time. So this week, the Supreme Court heard arguments on the Biden administration's plan to provide student loan debt relief for tens of millions of Americans. If the justices, though, strike it down, there are going to be a lot of unhappy voters across the country in 2024, including many in important battleground states. So let's unpack this. How did we get here? Well, first, let's look at the cost of college tuition. In over the last 30 years, the cost of a private university's tuition has gone up 80 percent. Tuition in public university has gone up 125 percent. Those are some big jumps for what it's worth. The cost of both housing and cars, those numbers are percentages are actually higher than the cost of education. Still, uh, this Biden student debt relief plan, if enacted, would provide up to $20,000 of relief for those that got Pell Grants, up to $10,000 for those with other types of student loans. And guess what? When this was offered, it was popular. Over 26 million people have already applied for this debt relief, even though it is not clear whether it's going to be allowed to happen. And if you break it down by states, and you know, like we like to do it around here, by battleground states, you see these are some big chunks of voters who might not be happy if this gets overturned. Over a million in Pennsylvania, over a million and a half in Florida, a million in Georgia. You see where this is going. This is a popular program. 
If it gets repealed, there are going to be some unhappy voters. Before we go, this week marks the 58th anniversary of Bloody Sunday, when police beat and tear gassed hundreds of protesters in Selma, Alabama, who were marching for racial equality and voting rights. Back in 2015, I had the honor of speaking to Congressman John Lewis on the 50th anniversary of the Selma March about his experience leading the marchers that day. We were kneeling. We were knocked down. They started beating us with nightsticks, tramping us with horses, and releasing the tear gas. I was hit in the head by a state trooper with a nightstick. I lost consciousness. Fifty years later, I don't recall how I made it back across that bridge to the little church that we had left from. Apparently, a group literally carried me back to the church. It'd be perfectly understandable if you were bitter. Bitter today, bitter a week later uh, from when it happened, bitter 20 years. Were you bitter in, uh, ever? I was after not all bitter this? then. I'm not bitter now. I grew in the movement to accept the way of love the way of peace, the way of nonviolence, the way of forgiveness as a way of life, as a way of living. John Lewis died in 2020. President Biden is in Selma today to commemorate the anniversary of Bloody Sunday, and the Reverend Al Sharpton will be leading the march alongside him. Up next, can Ron DeSantis stop Trump from the nomination while still courting the Trump voter? We're about to find out. Welcome back. All right. The Republican presidential primary. Donald Trump, in some ways, reannounced, if you will, this weekend at CPAC. Take a listen to his message. We are never going back to the party of Paul Ryan, Karl Rove, and Jeb Bush. We're not going back to people that want to destroy our great social security system. Even some in our own party. I wonder who that might be. In 2016, I declared... I am your voice. Today, I add, I am your warrior. I am your justice. And for those who have been wronged and betrayed, I am your retribution. Pat McCrory, I am your retribution. Wow. To see uh, a lot of good Republican candidates who would make great presidents grovel or kiss up to both CPAC and Club for Growth, is, is boss, it bothers me. Mm. Because... Um, not one of those groups has ever solved a problem. And right now we have some complex problems in this country that have to be solved. And what Donald Trump's going to realize is they're going to start having infighting among those two groups because mm -hmm. CPAC's with Trump, but Club for Growth, who use Trump in primary commercials to push their candidate, mm -hmm. are probably going to turn on Trump. Mm -hmm. So we have this internal warfare, which may result in a general election where the Democrats have their candidate, the Republicans have the last candidate, and uh, it might open up the door for a third party candidate because the independent voter, which is 40 percent of the registered voters now in mm -hmm. America, are going to go. Is this the only choice we have? Susan, we did a little survey of, of CPAC attendees just on the issue of Ukraine. Hmm. And it just shows you where the Trump base is on this. And it shows you this is a different lane than what we're used to. Take a listen. Of course, I feel for the people of Ukraine. I would like them to beat the Russians, but... We have so many problems. We have open borders here that the money could be going to. Well, I think support is okay, but uh, I think we need to be focusing on the people here first rather than other countries. Don't take my taxpayer money and send it over to Ukraine. Enough with this, you know, enough with this war. Susan, I think what's remarkable here is Donald Trump's carving up the outsider lane. I mean, this is not the mainstream <coughs> Republican position these days on Ukraine. But it is Trump's position. It, it is, although, and it's not the mainstream Republican position in that it's not Mitch McConnell's view, for instance. Yeah. But there is growing public concern, and not just among Trump voters, about the extent and the length and the cost of the U.S. commitment to Ukraine. And still majority support for continuing the effort. But it is really pressuring the administration to come up with some answers about how this war could end in a successful way and not go on forever. Uh, but, it, it, you know, Trump... there. We say, we say it's not the mainstream Republican position. Yeah. This is Trump's party. This yeah. is not the Republican party. It's the Trump party. Trump's position becomes 
the Republican position. And, but has he has he somehow been able to position DeSantis as part of the establishment? You said this a couple. You said this just now. You said it to Governor DeSuno, and I wrote it down because it was interesting to me. The idea that Donald Trump is trying to run as an outsider, yeah. because you know, from the jump, I have been hearing from sources close to his team that they want a position that says a la 2016, <clears throat> obviously not as of a la 2020. And somebody said to me this weekend, "Well, you know, he's doing better than he was at this point in 2016." And I said, "I sure hope so. He was the president <laughs> for four years. I mean, it's, it's almost as though they're trying to erase the fact that he was in the White House for four years to do what you're talking about here. Is he going to come up with a new nickname for DeSantis?" How is he going to position him as the outsider? But I will tell you what is so interesting to me, just in talking with people in the last 24 hours about sort of CPAC and Club mm -hmm. for Growth. You know, Trump allies are saying this is the most important gathering of conservatives since th that will happen in this campaign until the Republican primary debates. And then I heard somebody else, a, a, a rival campaign advisor, yeah. let's say, say, well, wait a second. This is a bunch of MAGA misfits who are showing up. Their words, right? Um, and I'm not quoting, but paraphrasing yeah. here, showing up to be super pro-Trump here. And actually, the adults in the room are, are going to Club for Growth and talking about yeah. what they're going to do on, from a policy perspective. But you know what the difference is between the Club for Growth and CPAC? The Club for Growth, the folks at Club for Growth talk behind the cameras, behind the scenes, not mm -hmm. to voters, but to donors, uh, uh, acting yeah. like establishment people. <clears throat> Donald Trump was talking to people. Whether, whatever you think of it, he was talking to the public. Um, this could be wild. You could have the major candidate in the party, an indicted criminal defendant, out on bail. He said he was going to keep running but if indicted. Do you know what the most interesting thing he said was to me? Because this was a lot of the sort of similar grievances we've heard. You know, it was new. He said people should vote by mail-in ballot. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Speaking of new, Larry Hogan is not running. I assume that has as much to do with Chris Sununu perhaps getting a jump start on him. Well, they're Pat. all looking for a lane, and you yeah. probably didn't see a lane unless it's a third party potential lane, which again could happen. You, 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 you look, you've been, you, you've yeah. been to some meetings with no labels. That's right. Joe Manchin's been to some meetings with no labels. He's been flirting about this. Is this only if it's Trump, Biden? That this gets I think traction. if it's two choices where the majority of people say the parties have failed us, there's a better choice to be president yeah. of the United States. And you would like Donald and you like Donald Trump because the voters who draw with a no labels candidate come from the Democratic side. And they're getting on the, they're getting on the ballots. They're getting on the ballots in the states. And you got to remember, ballots is a state issue, mm -hmm. not a federal issue. Right. It's not a party issue. It's a state issue. So they're, they, that's their goal that they can get ac yeah, ballot access to yeah. all fifty states. Get Every on one the of ballot these, yeah. enough to win the presidency. They, they've tried this. Do you buy it? It's you an insurance this? policy. If if the majority of people do not yeah. agree with the two parties selection, and right now the majority of Democrats don't agree with Biden, yeah. and the majority of Republicans don't agree with Trump, so it's going to be but interesting. But there's a significant fraction of Republican voters who will stick with Trump no matter oh, I what. Know that if well. he's in jail, <laughs> they will stick with Trump. That's right. And that is a kind of diamond <laughs> hard support yeah. big no money. other the candidate way, right. in America would have. Club for Growth is money right. talking. It's big, yeah. super PAC money. All right. Speaking of that, i got to stop the talking because i got to end the show. <laughs> That's all we have for today. Thanks for watching. We'll be back next week because if it's Sunday, even Selection Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.